Hi everybody, we recently had the pleasure of sitting down with Forrest Fenn, Susan Caldwell, and Lou Bruno to talk about Once Upon a While. I wanted to thank them all so much for taking the time to sit down and allow me to do this interview. Misty blue sky, take me on your treasure dive. We're gonna think it's a picture of Brad Pitt with a couple of balloons. <laughs> Are we rolling? Yes, we're rolling. Okay. Yes. <laughs> when did this book come out? This particular one? Because there was a revised copy last year. They yeah. own this book. Yeah. Oh, okay. This book's that for themselves. Okay. The, the first edition the first of this edition. book came out in November of 2018. As far as all the, like the the photographs and everything, you did all that also in the book because. The photography. I, I loved all the pictures. I loved how the book was laid out in like short story form, where every you know everything was like um, one story, one story, one story, right. and it, it flowed perfectly. You know, I was able to just go through that book, and I enjoyed it tremendously. All everything in that book. Each each story was unto itself, but then at the very end, when we have the compilation of all the stories, Forrest took a lot of time um, in terms of sequencing mm -hmm. and then and then of course there was a lot of discussion between all of us about what the sequence should be mm -hmm. but that was that was involving when you told the story of helping Joe tear the covers off the comic books and then you were able to take the two comic books home at, at night and read them and uh, to me and then I also remembered your story that you told about the making the marbles and selling the marbles. You seem like a businessman all the way back when you were preteen. <laughs> you know, I never got a, an allowance from my father, mm -hmm. although I mowed the grass and did all of those things. Other kids were getting, you know, a nickel a dime or a quarter a week, and I, I never got anything. So, sure, I had a lot of things to do. To, I mean, when I went to school, my mother would make me a sardine sandwich and put an apple in the sack or something. Not, that didn't appeal to me at all. So in, in order for me to, to, to upgrade my standard of living, well, I had to have side jobs. And, yeah. you know, I told a story recently someplace. I remember I mowed two, two, my neighbors, I mowed two yards and got a total of, I got a dime one time and a quarter the next, uh, 15 cents. And I had, 50, I had a quarter in my hand I remember how proud I was. I put my, I put the quarter tight in my hand, and I put my hand in my pocket and walking down the street because you know, I've I've got two. This is two days. Yeah. I mean, a quarter means five wimpy hamburgers, or it means yeah. four wimpy hamburgers and a coke, or it means three wimpy hamburgers, a coke, and a bag of Frito. I mean, <laughs> and I told myself, you know, I'm on top of the world, and and I'm not joking. I really felt that I was. Yeah. Walk standing straight up and down, and it was a, it was a big laugh to me. Yeah, well, oh, that's that's great. I, I was at the post office here one time a year ago or so. There was a little bit of drizzle, and the lady in the parking lot, the lady got out next to me. She had a coat on. She took her hands out of her pocket, and she draw, she accidentally dropped a nickel, a dime, and I think two pennies, seventeen cents. She looked at it. Walked on in the post office. I could not believe that. I mean, when I was a kid, that was the world to me. Yeah. And when she left, I couldn't get over there fast enough. And <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I never graduated from that way of thinking. Right, right. And I, I think it, that idiosyncrasy of my nature manifested itself in my entire career in the Air Force and, and, and the Gallery Venice. It money made a little, a little bit to me because. You know, I said, uh, you know, it, it's uh, having, having enough money is a lot better than having a lot of money. Yeah. Because you can eat, but you don't have the problems. Yeah. I believe that. Yeah. Well, it got you to where you are, you know, today, mm -hmm. and uh, that way of thinking. But uh, I think that, I don't know about, you know, kids today uh, are a little bit different, you know. I'm going to have grandkids. Yeah. You had mentioned also was that it took you a while to realize how smart that your parents were. You had said that 
they must have thought you were pretty dense. That, <laughs> that my past, the things that they had told me early on that that they were right, and I, would, I thought I was 100% sure I was right, but sometimes it takes you years to realize that how, how wise your parents really were. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I agree with that. In your experience, when you talked about uh, rainy day blessings, you came away from that experience with thoughts to live by. You said that there's so, no such thing as a self-made man, and don't underestimate the power of a quarter, and look for ways to give some of it back. That sounds like what you practice to me, because in your own life, like when you talk about buying uh, Peggy's mother a house, how you, uh, with Renell Jacobson, and arranging where, taking her in the helicopter to uh, Yellowstone, to search Yellowstone, and all the things that you donated to the, you know, Buffalo Bill Museum and Cody, and I, I know there's a lot of other things that you've done that, you know, we look up to you for, for these things that you've done. I think it goes back to be thankful for what Mm -hmm. I, I did not make good grades in school and I didn't go to college and as a result a lot of people didn't expect very much from me and it, it, it's rewarding to me to be able to give things back to museums and yeah. to, to other charities. Yeah. I ha we have a, a cancer fund that comes from the, the percentage of the books that the bookstore sells and I think we've given ninety thousand dollars to oh, wow. to, to oh. people who who have in, may have insurance, but there's a lot of things that insurance doesn't pay. Yeah. And so it, it it's fun and rewarding to to tell my you know I am helping somebody. Yeah, yeah, and it is important. I'm a cancer survivor twice myself, so I know how important that, that is. You know, but um. I was going to ask also about that. You said you were an avid collector of uh, the Comanche clothing, weapons, and photographs. Um, when, when did you, you know, become have an interest in the Native American culture? Well, I, lo I love history, and I, I was born and raised in Central Texas, and mm -hmm. the Comanches and the Kiowa was ranged from. Oklahoma down to the part of the country that I lived in, and my grandmother, I remember her telling me that when she was a little kid in Fort Worth, watching the cows and the Comanches run through their barnyard trying to catch chickens, uh -huh. and I fell in love with that part of the history, Comanche, yeah. Cowas, Southern Shine, Oto, Osage, and Arapaho, and I became a student of the Quahara Comanches, and Connor mm -hmm. Parker, Connor Parker's father was a man by the name of Nakona. He was chief of all, all of the Comanches. And I did a lot of research on, on that, and I have a, have a nice collection of Connor Parker, vintage Connor Parker photographs. And I don't know, it just, there was a time at the Battle of Blanco Canyon in, in, in north central Texas where Connor Parker rode up on a horse behind Trooper Gregg and kept, shot him with a Smith and Wesson American and he fell off his horse and was buried right there. Mm -hmm. Well, I bought the R.G. Carter papers that had a map to where Trooper Gregg was buried, and I spent uh, I spent hundreds of hours out there looking for that grave. Mm -hmm. And that battle was a pretty good battle, you know. I mean, we're looking at, at canteens laying on the ground that troopers dropped or mm -hmm. something. I remember we picked up a couple of buttons off of uniforms, and I mean, that's, you know, that's history staring you in the face. and. It, it comes to life and it's much more rewarding than reading something in a book. Right, right. And I love to traipse through the countryside, you know, and I think I made a comment in my book, I wish I was there to watch Corner Parker mm -hmm. ride by on his black charger with his full trail eagle feather bonnet dragging the ground. I mean, it's just so romantic. I mean, you, you could eat it with a spoon. It's so yeah. romantic. Yeah, yeah. You said that you have more of the, uh, is it Archie, Archie Carter? You probably have more information about him than anyone alive today. Do you have any ideas of writing a book about him? Well, uh, there's several books written about that time, yeah. Okay. Uh, 
I can't think of the titles, but I, I have three or four of them. Okay. And that's that's a very interesting time. Texas, the Stake Plains, the Llano Escadado means Stake Plains. And there was a time when Nicholas Nolan took his cavalry out in the, in the North Texas, and there was no, there was, there was nothing. There's not even cactus there hardly, and they ran out of water, and, and most of the troopers died, and so many Christmas. I mean, and so what? What they would do is they'd stack rocks up, and they'd put a sign that says to Amarillo, 80 miles or something. Otherwise, you you didn't know where you were going. There yeah. was no there were no roads. There, there were trails everywhere, but they were animal trails and. We don't realize how tough times were, yeah. and the horse has to drink water, and they have to eat grass, and there wasn't either one of them out there. Right, right. And Nicholas Nolan was a captain in the army and commanded his troop, and he didn't know where to go. A lot of it, his troops abandoned, and you know they're, they're looking for water. Mm -hmm. Tough, tough times. Yeah. Um, Elfric Jerry uh, Marble. Elfric Jerry Marble. Yeah. Huh? Mm -hmm. he, he, I, I, when I was writing my book on Joseph Henry Sharp, a biography. I interviewed Elfred Jerry because he was one of Sharp's main models. Mm -hmm. And he was blind when I when I first met him. And, and his daughter took me into a dark room where Elfred was laying on the bed. And, El, and she introduced me. And Elfred didn't open his eyes, but he said, Mr. Finn, it's, it's nice to see you. <laughs> and I had a great interview with him. Those, in those days, a lot of the Indians were very, very private, yeah. and I learned that if I wanted to get an answer, the best way to get an answer is to tell you something that's wrong and let you correct me. Mm -hmm. If I ask you the question, you won't tell me, but if I say something wrong, you'll correct me. Okay. That's why I did that. When I, when I walked out of the room with Elkfoot's daughter, she said something like, Soon the leaves will fall off of the apricot tree or something like that. And I knew what she meant, and the next day he died. He wow. was 104 years old. Wow. I mean, and then you, I know you said that you, you kind of, you wish that you would have met more, of, you know. The, oh, yeah, there, was, there were so the, many other names. names. You know, the Indians yeah. had their names, and, and the, the white man translated those names into in in the English, and like Lady Pretty Blanket. I wonder what that translated to in, in, in Indian language. George Eats Alone. I mean, there were great names that these Indians had, and, and I, I said that, you know, I wish I had been able to, to know what their, their name was before the white man got a hold of it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, and there's the pictures, and, you know, that, that you have of, um, you know, some of the Native American pictures are just nobody else. Nobody else has those. You know. Well, those were taken at a time when, when tourists went buying pottery and leave work. You know, mm -hmm. everything was made for a purpose. I mean, I'm trying to survive. I don't have time to. And American Indians had a lot of pride. They made wonderful things and great talent. And I just think what it was like in a teepee and. In South Dakota, in, in 1840, I mean it's 40 below zero. There's, there's not a buffalo around, and I mean, please tell me how they even survived. It's, it's amazing right. to me. Right. But they acclimated. You know, they were a different type of person in those days. In in the book, uh, Osborne Russell, Journal of a Trapper, he talked about in, in in the winter time, climbing up on the mountain. Wearing beaded, wearing moccasins, just mm -hmm. moccasins, mm -hmm. and it's 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 20 degrees because he wanted to, he could shoot an elk or a deer, but he wanted a mountain goat or a mountain sheep. So he, I mean, it's, these guys were able to adapt, and that's the only way they survived. Yeah, and you know, in the Journal of the Trapper, he also talked about he like climbed down uh, this steep uh, hill, and there was a, a pottery water vessel or something there that had been left there and I thought wow you know that to find that out in the middle of nowhere like that. It's interesting to 
try to figure out who made that and what yeah. was it done and why was it left there. Right. That, that's what history is all about, mm -hmm. conjecture, trying to put yourself in the position of that person at that time. Right. So many of your memories of, you have so many stories uh, attached to all these things that you've collected over the years. I don't know how you remember all these stories. Well, I don't have a good memory except for things I want to remember. Okay. <laughs> and my memory is very good. <laughs> One of these things as a story, and it's too bad that, that that story can't come to life here and tell its own history. Yeah. Because the history is, I've got a tobacco canteen over there that, that General Cook made for an Indian that told Geronimo in the, in the surrendering that they got, they got this Indian out of Alcatraz. He was in prison uh -huh. and they enlisted him in the army and it, it, because he was a friend of Geronimo's and he went out and talked to Rano in the, in the surrendering to General Crook. I mean, that's the way things were were done in those days. Mm -hmm. I mean, inconceivable today that that, that kind of thing happened. Yeah, yeah I, I don't, like I said, I, I have no idea when, how you remember these stories. I appreciate that you have these stories that you can tell of these different items, and then all the pictures that were in the book and the stories to go along with them. I just, I was fascinated by you know, reading this. But um, we, I was wondering, do you have any other books that you might think about writing? Well, I have three books in my computer, but I very much enjoy the fact that I'm not going to finish them. <laughs> I tell myself I run out of words, really. I mean, my best book is in my computer. It's called Closet Stories of Taos. It's about the characters and the artists in, in Taos, but it's not an art book. It's a gossip book. Uh -huh. Long John Dunn, Doe Belly Price, Mace McHorse, great names. I mean, Mace McHorse had the dealership there, and, and Long John Dunn got the first car, and Mabel Lujan got the second car. And there's wonderful stories about those things. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> if, if I was 20 years younger, I'd write that. It would be a bestseller because it, everybody loves gossip, and that's, <laughs> that's a gossip book. Yeah. Great stories about Freda Lawrence. And, I mean, there's, a, there's an unsolved murder. Who murdered Arthur Manby? I can solve the murder in my book. It was Teresita Ferguson, who was a brujo. And, I got that information from a man that was living up there who wrote the biography of Long John Dunn, and that wasn't even his name. His name was Hill, but he had to change his name because the Texas Rangers were after him for killing two people in Texas. I mean, great stories, and, and, and you know. Write that book. I was going to yeah. say, you know, over, and you know as, soon as, as soon as this goes out there, there's going to be people. Well, Long John Dunn. <laughs> have a, a tape of Long John Dunn talking at a party at Mabel Dodge Lujan's home. He had the greatest voice in, in the world. And, and he, owned, he owned all the gambling in Taos. He owned the bridge to, to cross the Rio Grande. If you wanted to go to Denver, you had to pay him a fine. He owned the whorehouse. And he owned <laughs> the transportation. I mean, he picked people up at Lamy, New Mexico, in a stagecoach to take him to Taos. It was a three-day trip to Taos and a stagecoach. Oh, wow. And going up that hill uh, in the Taos, you know, that big hill going up in the Taos. Mm -hmm. Joseph Sharp used to ride in that thing, and the horses would strain, and he'd make everybody get out and push because he, <laughs> he hated to see the horses strain so much. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the way things... And then the car came along, mm -hmm. and... Great thing, I mean, Gaspar, uh, he was writing, Long John Dunn was giving Leon Gaspar to ride one time when Gaspar just reached Tao, reached New Mexico. Mm -hmm. And Long John Dunn says, How much money do you have? And Gaspar said, I've got so many dollars. And Long John says, Well, give, give me, give me. $2,500 because you can't trust the banks here. And when you know, need some of your money, just come to. And Leon gave him the money. I mean, and there was a story where, where they, Leon Gaspard rented part of the, the, the 
lodge up there. I forget the name of what they call it, but they were they had moved in and and there was a knock on the door and and Gaspard opened the door and this guy says, tall, good looking cowboy with a hat on and and, and this guy says says, My name is Herbert Dutton and and Leon Gaspard says, Well I know who you are and Herbert Dunn says, well, I belong to the Tau Society of Artists, and they don't like you. <laughs> but he said, I think I would like you, and I would like to talk to you. They signed a contract that if, if Leon Gaspard would show Herbert Dunn how to put more color in his paintings, yeah. then Dunn would show Gaspard where the great hunting places were around Taos. And there's a story about they're out in the snow bear hunting, and they look over there, and they see a bear sitting by a tree. Dunn says, quick, take the gun and shoot the bear. So Gaspard sh shoots shoots the bear and nothing happens. The bear just sits there. <laughs> and Dunn says, well, shoot the bear again. So he shot it and nothing happened. Dunn says, give me the gun because Dunn was a professional hunter. And he shot the bear and the bear didn't move. They went over there. The bear was frozen. It was in a trap. <laughs> and the trap had belonged to one of the mean guys around Taos. And, and Dunn says, let's get out of here quick before this guy comes in finds a wish who shot his bear full of bullet holes. <laughs> I mean, those are the kind of stories that... <laughs> you like that. I bought the Leon Gaspard home. The house, the contents of the house, all the costumes, the garage that was full of wonderful furniture, and the, the guest house behind there that, that, that Eric Sloan rented in 1921 from Leon Gaspard. And great stories of but in the library upstairs, adjacent to Gaspard Studio, was, was full of books and ledgers and diaries that uh, Gaspard had two wives, and both of them were copious writers. I mean, they, I mean, in that library, I found this tax returns, canceled checks. I mean, and lots of books that were insi inscribed to Leon Gaspard from famous people, artists, and mm -hmm. other people too, and just, I mean. All of a sudden, here's things that I'd heard of, tertiary things that I had heard a little bit about, but all of a sudden, this stuff it hits me in the nose. I mean, that's why I wrote the Leon Gaspard book, yeah. because there's so much information there was going to die on the vine. I mean, it screamed at me to, to write that book. I think the other one's screaming at you, too. What? I've got a lot of people screaming. <laughs> For different reasons. I told you, now, now you let the cat out of the bag. <laughs> you let us know. <laughs> and by defense, I said in one of my books, I've written my epitaph. My epitaph you said that says, I wish I could have lived to do the things I was attributed to. I think that was in Throw the Chase. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> She designed that book for me. Oh, did you? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you did this one and the Thrill of the Chase and the Gaspar and, and, and too, too Far to walk. walk. Too Far to Walk. Okay. Wow. She's the world's greatest book designer, and, and there's the production manager over there. She really works for Lou. He keeps all of us in I don't understand check. how that works because she works for Lou, but I got to pay her. <laughs> <laughs> there's something he going keeps, on there that I don't everybody understand. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Well, I've, I've enjoyed all the books, so just well, so have I, meaning. Well, you know, with every book that we've done together in that six, there are times when we just laugh and laugh. And there are times we get nose to nose. I mean, I've seen her when she was tough, I've seen her <laughs> when she was mad at me. One, one time in my book, I, I don't know which one of my books I talked about, Spices going through my wife's spices, and I this opened one of those yeah. spices, and I, and I said something in there is dead, I, and, <laughs> and we started laughing. And was, making I, that, I got a real kick out of that. And then when you counted the the cloves, and you had like three bottles of cloves, <laughs> and then you said about the vanilla that you know, like you can smell it, but don't taste it. <laughs> That's a true story. <laughs> Try that sometime. Don't ever taste yeah, it. Yeah, I know. It I, smells yeah. great. But. Yeah. I was baking with my granddaughter, and she said, Grandma, can I take a taste? And I said, yeah. I turned around, and she 
downed it, and then she spit it in the sink. <laughs> she spit it in the sink, so she learned that lesson too. <laughs> Might be a good time to get okay. okay, well, thank you so oh, much. I wanted to say thank you, Mr. Finn, so much for allowing us to document these amazing stories and uh, share with your viewers. Yeah, thank you so much. Misty blue sky, take me on your treasure dive. Shades of blue holds feather wings And arms made out of golden strings I give anything, anything Shades of blue holds feather wings And arms made out of Treasure die. I've got nothing to lose.